basis. We need to get all the energy into his little field. And in that time of the standing there, which seemed like hours, but it was only moments, they said, you have to put both hands on the, on the child. You have to allow your energy to move through and fill him up. And then after you do this, what you want to do then is to share your greatest human joys. You want to give this child reason to wake up, reason to stay, reason that this planet is full of optimism and hope and love and joy. So if you're a teacher, talk about teaching. If you're a bridge builder, talk about your bridges. What brings you human joy? What grounds you that you're happy in this space? I said, okay, so I, I needed hundreds of people. They said, bring as many as you can get. So I got on a telephone, I called everybody in my little black book, people I'd only dated once or twice, can you come to the hospital and see my kid? I'm sure they thought I was crazy. Now lots of people I didn't tell them what I was doing. When they came into his room, I'd usher them over to his bed, I'd say, just touch him, just see, because I didn't want to get into the fact, oh, we're doing an energy transfer, you know. Just touch him, just share. Now tell him, tell him the things that you love about being here. And they said, really? And I'd say, yeah, tell him a story, sing him a song, share with him, because he can hear you. So we did this for three solid days, and my son got worse, and worse, and worse. His bowels started to pass out of his diaper. So I'm not talking blood now, I'm talking the organ itself is sloughing off and exiting his body. And he smelled like rotten meat. It was really disgusting. But nobody said a word because there were some rules to this. One was absolutely no negative energy in that room. None. If the doctors had to discuss him, if the nurses had to do anything, they had to do it as if he was awake. And good morning, how are you? And talk to him as if everything was, he was awake and there. And if they had a diagnosis to discuss or to tell me how bad things were, they had to come out of his room and away from his field. And everybody listened. Everybody listened. We had to play music. So during his awake time, we played music that brought my son the greatest joy. Bon Jovi and Aerosmith and the rock and roll tunes, man. Here I am at ICU of a major hospital playing Bon Jovi. And me going, Evan, this is your favorite. So we're playing the things that bring my son his greatest joy. And when he was in his quiet time, we played Mozart. And we, we did this for three solid days. So here we are at the end. Nobody's talked negative. Everybody's been positive. There's no crying. Nobody was allowed to cry. My father, my mother, everybody went into that hospital room. No tears. Not a single tear. So we're at the three day mark and the doctor said, look, this is really bad. You've got to unplug this kid. And I'm out in the room going, holy God, you said three days, you know, 72 hours. And all of a sudden I hear Shelley come, he's awake. And I rush down the hallway and I go in his room and he's sitting up, looking around. And I said, hey baby. And he looks at me and I said, do you know who I am? And he nodded his head. And the doctor said, that's a reflex. Uh, your son is brain dead. And I said, is my name Sheila? And Evan went, I said, is my name Joanne? And he went, like, what's wrong with you? You don't know your own name? You could see his face was pondering. My mother's gone crazy, you know. I said, is my name Shelly? And he nodded his head because he had tubes. And I said, that's enough of that. We're not going to have any more conversation about that stuff. And the doctor said, ah. I said, uh-uh. So for the next 16 hours, 12, I don't, I don't know the time frame, but you can get a gist, another half a day to a day. I held him, I rocked him, we sang songs, and the doctor came in and he said, well, we have to send you out of ICU because your son's not sick enough to be here. And I'm like, thank you. The burn marks on his chest were gone from the paddles, and he smelt like new babies. You know what new babies smell like? So here was a son that was rotting and his bowels are passing out of his body. He smells like new babies and the burns are gone off his chest. These are the tangible things I can physically see. So the doctor hauls me aside and he says, well, we're sending you to recovery, but your son will never walk, he'll never talk, he'll never be your son again. He's always going to be brain dead. And I was like, we're done with the conversation. I told you no more. We go to recovery. Within three days, my son says, mommy, I got to poop. And I walked him to the bathroom. And that was the end of it for me. We're home free, he's healthy, we're going home. 
I didn't want to be weird. I didn't want to be standing here in front of you telling you this story. I just wanted to go back to my life. Now, my life wasn't so great. It was Prozac and welfare. But that was my life, and it was the one I was comfortable with. So we went back home, and uh, we had Christmas. And everybody would say, oh, you must have found God. I was like, no. And they'd say, well, you must. And I'd say, no, no, everything's done. Thank you for your, your wonderful prayers, and thank you for all your help. It's all done now, so let's just move on. And I put my son back in daycare with the intention that we were getting on with our lives. July came, and I had this overwhelming urge to drive to Ontario. Now, I had a car that really couldn't make the trip, but I was going to go. So I got in the car, I drove to Ontario, and just outside of Quebec, Riviere de Loup, there's some mountains. And I was driving up over this mountain, and I heard, hello, dear one. <laughs> Six months after the accident, seven months, really. And here's the voice in my ear. And I went, oh, man. <laughs> I swelled up like a, my father says, a Harper Tomcod. <laughs> Just... <laughs> I started to feel so much bliss and joy, I thought my body was going to explode. I was, I was like, oh, this is so good. This being in my car or in my space was filling me up with the most incredible joy and bliss I'd ever felt. And I started to move my car into the other lane. And there's a big truck coming down the road. And I swerved back. And the voice says, it's too dangerous to be here right now. <laughs> Well, why did you come here? So very quickly, this being says, look, we have so much to share with you. We have so much to talk to you about. We want to tell you about you. We want to tell you about what we know and how to, all we can share with you about the world and the universe. But it's, it's too dangerous. Enough. So he said, I'm going to go, but we're coming back. We'll be back. And I'm saying, don't go, don't go. And I'm screaming and I'm crying because this is all I have of some sort of truth that I'm seeking. And he said, we'll come back and we'll talk again. And as the energy started to move out of my field, it felt like if you took two pieces of damp Play-Doh and put them together, they would go and glom together. And then as you pulled them, they go and they'd stretch until there was a pop and then there would be a break. Well, this is what this being, it felt like and when he was in my field, it was like we had joined. Now as the being was moving away from me, it was this pulling. And then all of a sudden this little... And I said, what's your name? And he said, my name is Aramis, and we will come again soon. And that was it. I was fit to be tied. I pulled by the side of the road, and I cried and cried and cried and cried, and my kids wake up and they said, what, what's wrong with you? And I said, I'm having a moment. <laughs> So off I go to Ontario, and I get to my father's house, and I know something's happening. Something, happens, something has happened to me, but I don't know what it is. So I read three books. I read a book called Talking to Heaven with James Van Prague. I read a second book about Edgar Cayce, but that one kind of freaked me out, and I put it away. I didn't read that one. And the third one was a book um, by Danny and Brinkley, who had been hit by lightning and was dead for half an hour, and came back with what he called prophecy. And I was like, well, this is resonating. Okay. So I put the books away and I vowed I wouldn't, I wouldn't read any more books because now I knew I was having a near-death experience. But I didn't want to read everybody else's near-death experience because if I was having one, I wanted to be able to write and talk about mine to see if it was true. Because I, you know, part of me thought maybe I'm making it up or maybe, somebody, maybe I heard something or something. So that's kind of where I was with this, that I didn't really know if I believed my own stuff. So I come back from Ontario and I start seeking out somebody to help me. So I go to the ministers in my community and they're all like, we don't know what to tell you, sorry, we, we can't help you. Pray. I was like, oh, okay. Now, I wasn't into understanding that this was a God event. Extraterrestrials and energy? I can relate to that. I'm a science fiction kid. I'm a Star Trek kind of person. I understand extraterrestrials and energy. That's what saved my kid. But I don't understand the correlation between a God source or a creative source and what had happened to me. So the, the connection there was not made at that point. 